Jesus. If you have your Bible tonight, turn with me to the book of John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Two weeks ago, we began a study on the Gospel of John, and, and here we are in the third week, and we're still in the first chapter of the book of John. And uh, so we're going to spend some time in the book of John. This has become one of my favorite books of the Bible, and I love the story of John. Uh, John not only wrote the Gospel of John, but he wrote the three epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, as well as the book of Revelation. And starting the first Sunday in uh, the month of May, on Sunday nights, uh, we're going to begin a, a, a Sunday night study on the book of Revelation. So we'll be studying two books that have been written by the Apostle John, the book of John, uh, the Gospel, and the book of Revelation as well. So I encourage you uh, to be here on Sunday nights. A lot of churches don't have church on Sunday nights, and so uh, if, if you know of somebody that attends one of those uh, I guess we could call them backslidden churches. I don't know. I'm just kidding. But if they don't have church on Sunday night, we invite them to come and be a part of uh, our services here. And we'll be studying the book of Revelation starting the first Sunday in May. John chapter 1, and we'll start with verse number 15. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? Speaking of Elijah. And he saith, I am not. Art thou, art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we, that we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah, speaking of Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptized. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bare record that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist knew the truth of Jesus Christ. See, John was at the Jordan River. He was baptizing people. He was preaching a message of repentance. When people repent, this means that we recognize the wrong and the things that we have done. And we know that we have done wrong and we feel guilt and we feel remorse and we feel sorrow for what we have done. We regret what we have done and we, we change our ways by asking God to forgive us. And we allow Jesus Christ to become the Lord and Savior of our life. And then we have a commitment to Him never to do the things of this world again. 
but to continuously follow Him and to serve Him with all of our heart and with all of our soul. And so John the Baptist was preaching a message of repentance. And in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, the Bible says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 19, or verse 13, He said, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. When we go out into the community to reach out to people, when we build a church and we're trying to get a church to grow, we are not going out and inviting people from other churches to come to our church. We don't want them to leave their church and be a part of this church. If they're faithful to their church, they need to stay at their church. We're not going out to try to find the saved. We're not going out to try to find the righteous. But we are going out to try to find the lost. We are going out to try to find the sinner, to try to find those who are addicted to things of this world. We're going out and we're looking for those who are lost, who are bound and destined to spend eternity in hell because we want to let them know that we, the church, love them and that Jesus loves them and we want them to know that there is a Savior who loves them, that He cares for them, that He died on the cross for them, He gave His life for them, and we want them to know who He is and that they will turn around and repent and surrender their life to the will and the cause of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus came to save the sinner. And John the Baptist was preparing the way for Jesus to come. John's message of repentance served a purpose. And that was to get people's hearts in tune with God. Why? Because Jesus was fixing to come into their community. John's job as a preacher who was sent by God was to let people know about the love of God and to preach the truth about sin, to preach holiness, to preach righteousness, and to preach about the coming judgment of God. Jesus was coming soon, and John wanted to let the people know. See, it's the same in our world today. For 2,000 years, preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ have been proclaiming a message of repentance. They're trying to let this world know it's time to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. Every one of us in this room tonight, we are all called by Jesus Christ to be a minister of the gospel. If we have been saved by His blood, we need to tell someone about the love of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about being a pastor or a preacher. You don't have to have credentials or, or be ordained with the Assemblies of God or, or go to Bible college and get some kind of a, a degree and everything goes with it. But if you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you have been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you have a response responsibility to the Word of God to go out and be a witness for Jesus Christ. That's what He has called us to do. Jesus told the disciples to, to be a witness. He has given us the power to be a witness for Him, to tell someone about Jesus. What do we tell them? Tell them that He came to save them. Tell them how, how Jesus came to redeem them. Tell somebody that Jesus can still heal. Tell somebody that Jesus delivers, that He sets the captives free, that, that He can deliver their soul. Tell someone that Jesus is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Tell someone about Jesus. You see, it's through this anointing and this power of the Holy Ghost that we're enabled to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Just before Jesus ascended into heaven, He gave the disciples this commandment. They, they were trying to seek after what was going to take place in the end time. They asked Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? But Jesus did not want them to know. He said, it's not for you to know the time or the seasons which the Father has put in His own power. But He said, this is what's important. But you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he said, you're going to be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and into the uttermost part of the earth. See, that's what Christ wants us to do, is to be a witness. Jesus came to fulfill the law of the Old Testament. In John chapter 1, verse 17 through 18, the Bible says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, 
the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So here is a question that a lot of people seem to misunderstand. If no one has seen God, but people see Jesus, then why do we say Jesus is God if no one has seen God? See, we need to understand one simple principle about the Word of God and about who God is. We serve one true God. But this raises a question that has split many churches in our world today. And, and they become confused. And so they want to know, is there just one God? Or is there a trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And, and they want to know, what does all of this mean? And so the answer to that question is, yes, we serve one God. And yes, He is revealed eternally as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We believe in the Father, who is the creator of the universe and mankind, who, who sits on the throne in heaven, who is the supreme ruler of this universe. We believe in the Son, who is the redeemer of mankind, who shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, who was the word of God, who was in the beginning with God, who was, who was God and is God, and this same word that became flesh and dwelt among us. We believe in the Son. We believe in the Holy Ghost who dwells in the hearts of every believer. It's the Holy Spirit that draws us to conviction. We believe in the Father, but the only way that an individual can go to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. We must believe in the Son in order to get to the Father. Jesus clearly told us in John 14, verse 6, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We believe in the Father. We believe in the Son. But what about the Holy Ghost? Where does the Holy Ghost fall in place in us getting to the Father? See, we, we, we go through the Son to get to the Father. But the Bible also says in John chapter 16, verse 13 through 14, Jesus is speaking here. He says, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you uh, what things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. So no man can come to the Father. No man can get to God except they go through the name of Jesus Christ. There's no other name whereby we can be saved. Acts 4.12 says there's no salvation in any other name. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Allah cannot save you. Hinduism cannot save you. Buddha cannot save you. Confucius cannot save you. But Jesus can. He's the way. The only way. He's not a way. He is the way. 1 John chapter 2, 23, the Bible says, Whosoever denieth the Son, if they deny Jesus, the same has not the Father. He that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So we see that we're drawn by the Holy Spirit to the Son, who is the truth. And when we are drawn by the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, when we are in sin, the Word of God tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness, who is our advocate. In other words, if we get into the Word of God and we understand what the Bible teaches us, the Holy Spirit reveals that truth to us. He leads us to Jesus Christ. In other words, He is our direct line to God the Father in the throne room of heaven. So when we come to Jesus Christ, in John chapter 8, verse 17 through 18, Jesus is teaching a distinction and a relationship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. He said in, in, in verse 17 and 18, He said, It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. What Jesus is talking about here, he's referring to an Old Testament law in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 6, where the Bible says, At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. Think about that for just a moment. Every one of us in this room were put on trial. We're guilty of sin. 
Because the Word of God teaches us in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that sin, sin comes with a great price. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are put on trial. We're guilty of sin. We're deserving the death penalty. But one witness speaks up. Jesus Christ speaks up and says, wait a second, I paid the price for their sin on the cross of Calvary. I shed my blood for them. They don't have to suffer and die. They don't have to spend eternity in hell because I suffered in their place. And God the Father speaks up and says, I sent my only son to die on the cross for their sin. They don't have to go to hell because I love them and I sent my son to die for them. So we have two witnesses right there that are speaking up for us. And if we have repented of our sins, if we have accepted their witness to our spirit, then we have escaped that death penalty. So we see the Father and the Son and this witness. But who does the Holy Spirit witness to? Who is it that convicts us of sin? Who is it that draws us to the truth of God's Word? Romans chapter 8 verse 16 says, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of of God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three in one, working for our salvation. Jesus died on the cross. He was sent by the Father to die on the cross. The Holy Spirit gets a hold of our heart and, and communicates directly to us and says, wake up, child of God. You need to understand that you don't have to suffer in sin any longer. You don't have to suffer the punishment of sin. Yes, the wages of sin is death, but there is a gift that comes from God. And this is a gift of healing. It is a gift of salvation. It is a gift of forgiveness. And all you have to do is receive this gift. Amen. Church, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt Saturday and some of these gifts, some of these eggs out there are going to have gifts in them. Mm -hmm. But they have to make an effort to go get it. Yeah. It's not just going to come to them. They have to go out there and get it. And then not only do they have to pick up that egg, then they got to break it open and look inside it and see what's in it. And if they get a ticket, they get a price. It's the same way in our life. Salvation is not just going to come to you. You've got, to, you've got to come get your salvation. You've got to get your salvation at an altar of prayer. You don't have to physically come to this one. You can pray at your seat. You can pray at your house. Wherever you pray. The point is we must get to an altar of prayer and allow Jesus Christ to change us and to create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit in our life. Amen. See, John the Baptist preached repentance. His message was prophetic. In John chapter 1, verse 19 through 24, the Bible says, And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? He confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. The Gospel of Matthew also teaches about the ministry of John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 3, Starting with verse 1, the Bible says that in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath of to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. 
For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John preached a powerful message on repentance. See, repentance is a message today that we don't hear much of in today's modern church. We're living in a day and age in which people are taught to think good thoughts about themselves, to, to think high thoughts, and to have a wonderful feeling about themselves. In fact, I've heard from the pastor of one of America's largest churches say from his pulpit many times on television, he says, don't look at what's wrong in your life. Don't, don't look at what's wrong, but focus on what's good. He said, when God looks at your life, He's not looking at what's wrong. He's looking at what's good. And church, so many times people buy into that and they listen to that. You see, over the past several years, there's been an invasion in our churches of this carnality, this false doctrine of salvation. You see, it's nothing more than just watered-down humanism. They're trying to bring in uh, psychology and philosophy and call it the gospel truth, but it's not the truth. See, there's millions of people searching for answers to their problems, and they're searching for answers to, to the things in this world that's caused from sin, but then they go to some of these churches and they hear a, a watered-down message and, and telling people, don't look at what's wrong, don't worry about what's going on, just focus on the good side and look at what's good in your life. And yet, there's no change. There's no conviction. There's no salvation. There's no deliverance. See, we can't, we can't get saved if all we do is have a self-help program and, and teach people how to, how to better their home life and how to be able to wash dishes and to change oil in your car. That's good principles to know. People need to know stuff like that. But that's not going to get us to heaven. No. What gets us to heaven is repentance. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you repent, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. We must repent. There must be a change. There must be a new creation in our heart. See, Jesus even preached on repentance. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14 through 15, the Bible says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. When the very Son of God, Jesus Christ, appeared on the scene in His public ministry, He came preaching a narrow and exclusive doctrine of repentance and faith. See, if Jesus believed that repentance was necessary, if John the Baptist preached a message of repentance, and in fact, John the Baptist preached his message so strong, he got up in the pulpit and he called his congregation a generation of snakes. He said, oh, generation of vipers, repent. Imagine going to church on Easter Sunday morning. The church is full of visitors. And all of a sudden, the pastor gets up there, looks at everyone straight in the eye and says, you generation of snakes, repent. That split the church in a hurry, wouldn't it? But that's the way Jesus felt about it. They were so strong about repentance that they didn't beat around the bush. They told it like it was. They didn't care if it offended people. They didn't care if they were going to step on someone's toes. They didn't care what was going to happen. They preached the truth. See, we, we need to preach the truth. In, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, the Apostle Paul writes, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, which would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach another gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. I was reading that, and, and to get another understanding of it, I looked at it from the New Living Translation, and it really opens it up and, and, and brings the truth out. Paul is speaking, he says, I am shocked 
that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news. But this is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preached unto you. I say it again, what we have said before. If anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. Church, God is serious about the message of repentance. The word repent is mentioned over 100 times in the word of God. And when we look at the word repent, it's referring to a God-given, spirit-led change of heart, and mind, and soul. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, to repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. See, the problem is every one of us has sinned, but not everyone admits it. But the Bible is clear in Romans 3.23 that says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, until a person gets to a point where they understand that they are guilty and they're lost and they're undone and they're going to spend eternity in hell unless they get their life turned around, they're never going to come to an altar of repentance. That's why it's so important that in church service after church service that we tell the truth, that we teach the Word of God, that we don't beat around the bush, but we tell, tell folks what sin is, that sin's deadly, that sin is dangerous, that sin is a disease. And unless you get that disease out of your soul, they're going to spend eternity in hell. It makes no difference how we feel. It makes no difference what people say to us. You know, salvation is not based upon a feeling. It's not based upon uh, how good we look or how good we feel. But salvation is based upon our obedience to the Word of God. If the Word of God says, unless you repent, you will not see the kingdom of heaven, that's exactly what it means. Unless there is a turnaround, unless there is a change, a person will spend eternity in hell. There is no purgatory. There is no second chance. If they die lost without Jesus Christ, that's it. That's it. There's no turning back. And so why, well, that's why I, I think it's so important that we go out and that we knock on doors and we reach out and we tell people about Jesus because we're going to be accountable. Amen. If we don't tell folks about Jesus, how are they going to hear that gospel? If John the Baptist didn't tell people about Jesus, that there would be no disciples in Ephesus, when Paul was traveling through there, remember Paul ministered to some people in Ephesus. They were disciples of Apollos, who was a disciple of John the Baptist. They didn't even know about the Holy Ghost, but they knew about that repentance. They knew about Jesus coming. They knew about being baptized in water to believing on the one who was coming after John. See, John made a difference in his community. What if another person would rise up in this world that was like John the Baptist, that didn't care how, if, if he offended someone, that didn't care what, what people were going to do to him. John the Baptist went to the grave preaching repentance. He was beheaded for preaching a message of repentance. Church, we, we think we face trouble sometimes in this day and age, but we haven't seen nothing yet. We haven't seen a thing yet. I was reading in the book of uh, Exodus, Looking in the book of Genesis, some of the things that went on in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and some of the things that went on in Noah's days and in Babylon, unspeakable things that went on. And we haven't even seen it that way yet. But the Word of God says that it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in those days. It's going to get that way here. And we're seeing it in different parts of our country. We're seeing it in different parts of this world. There's going to be a time, church, you better get the Word of God in your heart because it could get to a point to where it's no longer going to be available for you to carry it around and to read it. Get it into your heart. Why? Because we must hide His Word in our heart that we might not sin against Him. Get into the Word of God. We must search our hearts and ask God to search us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You see, repentance basically involves two facts. 
First of all, it's a fact of sin, and it's a fact of God's grace. You see, if a person is not a sinner, of course we know they are, but if, if they thought they were not a sinner, then they wouldn't think they needed to repent of anything. How are they going to repent if they don't think they have anything to repent of? Some time ago I went to uh, New Orleans with a group from the Bible College, and we was going out and witnessing to people, and some of the techniques that uh, the professors taught us to do is basically we just walked up to people. I, I walked up to somebody and I said, sir, can I ask you a question? They said, sure. I said, if you was to die right now, would you go to heaven or hell? You know, everyone thinks they're going to heaven. They're sitting there smoking a cigarette in one hand, drinking a beer in the other hand, but yet they think they're going to heaven. And I said, what makes you so sure? And he said, well, I've lived a good life. I've never hurt anybody. I've never cheated on anybody. I've done good things and I try to do good. So I'm going to heaven. And the world thinks that, and they believe that. That's why it's important that we teach them the truth. Living good is not going to send a person to heaven. Think of it this way. If someone committed a crime, and they were standing before the judge, and yes, they said, yeah, I'm guilty, I did that, I did that crime. But that was a long time ago, it was in the past, and since then I've done a lot of good. Surely my good will outweigh the bad. What's that judge going to say? He's going to say, no, it doesn't work like that. You broke the law. It was wrong. It was against the rules. You've got to pay for that crime. That crime cannot go unpunished. If he's a good judge, he's going to make that person pay for that crime. It's the same way in our life. We've all sinned. It may have just been something simple a long time ago, but that sin is still there. We broke the law of God. Yes, we've done good things. We've done many good things. But the sin is still there. We broke the law. The, the punishment needs to be there. Something needs to be done. But all we have to do is admit that we've done wrong and allow God to forgive us and to change us. And we don't have to suffer that punishment. We don't have to suffer the penalty of sin. As long as we've got King Jesus living on the inside, we don't need anything else. We don't need that philosophy. We don't need the psychology. All we need is Jesus Christ. And when we allow Jesus Christ to make that difference in our heart, He can change us in a way that no one else can. Amen. We must repent. See, I want to look at the nature of repentance for just a moment before we close. In true biblical repentance, there's three things that need to take place. First of all, there needs to be a conviction. A conviction. This is where sin is admitted. To some people, this is the hardest thing in the world for them to do, to admit that they've done wrong. Uh, sometimes I've heard stories about husbands and wives. They, they get into an argument and, and one of them is right. I'm not going to say who. And one of them is wrong. And the hardest thing to do for husbands and wives is to admit to the other one, you were right and I was wrong. Am I telling the truth? And nobody speaks because they don't want to be guilty. But it's true. It's hard to admit when we've done something wrong. I'll tell the story. You've probably heard it from Brother Branklin. He was driving uh, from preaching a revival. He passed by a farm and he looked out there, saw this John Deere tractor. He told his wife, he said, look, that tractor, uh, that was a good tractor back there. That tractor had a cab on it. And she looked at him and said, Don, that tractor didn't have a cab on it. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I had, it, it was enclosed. It had a roof over the top of it. And she said, no, Don, it didn't. Miles and miles down the road, they kept arguing back and forth. And he, he finally turned around. He said, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to take you back there and show you that tractor had a roof on it. And he said, wouldn't you know it? By the time we got down there, they'd already taken the roof off that tractor. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's hard to admit when we're wrong sometimes. But conviction, that's where it begins. We have to admit that we're wrong. Man must see himself as a lost, ruined, guilty, desperately wicked sinner without hope or help and danger of spending eternity in hell. See, when a person repents, a lost sinner not only sees himself as a sinner, but he recognizes the fact that he has sinned against a just and holy God. See, the message that Paul preached was repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist prayed in Psalms 32, verse 5, he said, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. David prayed in Psalms chapter 51. He said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And I like what he says in verse 10. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Number two, we must have a spirit of contrition. We must be broken. This is where sin is abhorred. When, when someone sees himself guilty before God, it does something to our soul. We can't, I, I don't see how someone can come to an altar and repent without shedding tears. Because when we've done something wrong and we feel guilty about it and we understand the seriousness of it, it's going to make us emotional because we know we've done something wrong. We've broken God's heart. We've sinned against His Word. We're destined to spend eternity in hell. But all of a sudden, Jesus has rescued us. He's put this gift of salvation out there for us and it's free. And all we have to do is receive it. And, and, and we, we become broken. And, and our heart is broken because we realize how much love Jesus has provided for us on the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. See, to hate sin is to love God. And to love God is to hate sin. Three, we must be converted. In other words, there must be a change where sin is abandoned. We no longer do the things we used to do anymore. Repentance involves the forsaking of sin. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let them return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly Pardon. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And what does that mean? That means if you try to cover up what you've done, all you're doing is lying. You're covering up and you're digging the hole deep. That's why we must admit that we have sinned. We must confess to Jesus and we must ask Him to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. See, that was the purpose of of John the Baptist's ministry. So the Bible tells us that when John was baptizing and, and when Jesus was baptized, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, when Jesus, he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. See, that was the testimony from heaven of the Father's love for His Son, stating that this is the chosen one. This is the one who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. See, Jesus came to show us the way because He is the way. He is the truth. He is the light. No man can come to the Father except by Him. And so He lived to show us the perfect example. And if we will follow Him where He leads, He will guide us into all truth and in all holiness. Lord, we thank you. Father, for all that you have done. Lord, we thank you. For your grace and your mercy, Jesus. For the shed blood on the cross of Calvary. And Lord, as we come together this week. And we reflect on your death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, let us never take for granted the blood that you shed on the cross. Let us never take for granted your love. Let us never take for granted the suffering that you allowed to take place. On our behalf, for your word says you are wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon you, and with your stripes we are healed. Lord, draw us nearer to you, Jesus. And Lord, help us to serve you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and all of our mind.